Hope for Anxiety and OCD, episode 42. I'm your host, Carrie Bach, and today on our show, we're talking with Ed Snyder, who is a pastor, author, and anger management expert. And I know he has his own experience with anger that he's going to be sharing with us and talking about, you know, incorporating spiritual principles. Some people may wonder, why are we talking about anger on a show that has to do with anxiety? Well, anger can be a complex emotion and oftentimes runs alongside other emotions. So hang on, and if you deal with anger or know someone who does, this content may be really helpful for you. So Ed, thanks for coming on the show and talking with us today. Well, thank you, Carrie. It's an honor to be here with you on your podcast. When or how did you realize that anger had become a problem in your life? Wow, that's been a minute ago. Well, let me start here. I was always the overweight kid that was the bully magnet in school. So I was always getting made fun of, beat up, all that good stuff. I was quiet. You'd never tell that by knowing me now, but I was the quiet, shy type. Uh, Again, I knew I was overweight and all that good stuff. So I went through a lot of trauma there. That was early on in my elementary school years. I think it was about in junior high is when I realized, of course, back then I took it as, hey, I got some aggression here because my junior high football coach approached me and said, man, I want you on my team because of my size, you know, and of course I had a growth spurt at 12. So I stood six foot at 12 and husky. That's what my mom always said. You're just husky. So anyway, <laughs> good old mom. And so it was then that I joined the football team and realized the aggression that I had pinned up inside of me. In fact, to the point that my coach handed me this weird looking pad and he said, strap that on to the back of your hand because I was center uh, or nose guard. So I lined up with the center and he says, knock that center out of the way and go sack the quarterbacks. And so I did because, and I was successful at it because I was angry and I didn't identify the anger at that point so much as I identified the aggression that I had. It wasn't, you know, after four concussions and, you know, I played in my seventh grade, my eighth grade year. And in my freshman year, I had made it to the varsity team that I realized this is a little more than just skill and aggression. This is anger because I get up, you know, if I got tackled or knocked out of the way, I got up and I was ready to beat somebody down. That's when I identified. And then, of course, after my fourth concussion, I created a brain bleed and ended up in the hospital for three months and was facing some surgery. That's a whole nother testimony of what God did in my life. But that's about the time frame that I noticed the aggression and then realized what it really was is the years of being bullied and and the anger build up. Yeah. And being that you were playing football, was that aggression celebrated or did your coaches feel like, okay, this is a little bit too far. This is a little too much. Well, back then it was celebrated. It was mm-hmm. like, yeah, go after him, man. That's the way to sack them quarterbacks, you know, and all that stuff. Although I earned a, a reputation among the other teams, especially locally, that you, you're going to have to go after Snyder because we can't allow him to to get in there. And so they, they came kind of, <laughs> A little extra hard against me because of the aggression, but it was celebrated, which didn't help me. Sure. It kind of endorsed my my very negative behavior. Mm, okay. What was that process like later on in life when you did seek out help for the anger spiritually, mentally, emotionally? Okay, great question. And of course, going along with with my story, you know, I was in high school then, kind of my freshman year. And of course, like I said, I was in the hospital three months. That, That was a major interruption in my life. And that kind of made me realize, okay, you need to settle down. And I knew I had an issue because in my uncontrolled anger, there was two things you did not do to me. And that was hang up the phone on me or slam a door in my face. And my own mother, you know, was, was mad at me. And, and we were having a heated conversation, put it that way. It was teenage rebellion that she was trying to deal with. Anyway, she slammed the door in my face and it, it angered me. And I put my fist through the wall beside the door. That's when I'm like, this is not going well for me. So I just kind of dealt with it the only way I know how, which wasn't much. But my turning point, Carrie, was in when I got married. You know, I got married young. I met my wife when I was 
15 and knew that's her. That's the girl I'm going to marry. And my best friend, Bert, said, hey, dude, remember, you're only 15. <laughs> so, <laughs> You've got your whole life ahead of you. You don't have to settle down yet. <laughs> yeah, that's the girl. Of course, again, that's another another neat story. But, you know, we'll stick to the subject. It wasn't until Gail and I got married. And I, of course, I, I hid it because I didn't want her to know about this. You know, I might lose her. She's She's the love of my life in our first marital discussion, and God's got a real good sense of humor. He put together a hard-headed German descent and an Irish descent. I mean, it a red-headed Irish woman, just, mm -hmm. it was fun. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so we made a vow when we got married that we'll never go to bed angry at each other, that we'll get it resolved. And of course, she really didn't know. She knew I was spirited, quote unquote, but she didn't realize I had had this issue. And so we agreed to that we agreed and we vowed each other we're never going to go to bed or go to sleep angry at each other. And then also she told me, she says, look, when I get upset, just leave me alone. Let me go for a while. Let me cool off, which is classic textbook anger management technique is to breathe, go intellectualize the situation, come back, deal with it. You know, I'm, I'm the type, no, we're going to deal with it now. And so for the first 10 years of our marriage, I spent chasing her around the house saying, stop, we got to fix this. And I'm only fueling her fire. But anywho, in our first marital discussion, you know, she walked off or tried to, and uh, again, slammed the door in my face. And she not only slammed the door, she locked it. And I went into outer space. And of course, in my anger, I put my fist through that door and unlocked it. Now, for your audience clarification, I have never, ever laid a hand on any woman, especially that of my wife and of course, my mother. I, I've been raised better than that. So I never laid a hand on her, but I put my fist through that door and we finished the quote unquote conversation. Well, it wasn't until the next morning that we got up, we were having breakfast and she said, I don't know if I can do this. And I'm like, do what? what? What are you talking about? Because, you know, angry people, once they have their, their fit, you know, their, their rant, it's over. It's water under the bridge, move on. And it wasn't so with her. It, it shook her to her core that to see my fist come through that door and unlock it. And then, you know, all the unnecessary shouting and screaming and all of that. So that was a wake up call when she said that I did not want to lose this lady. She's the love of my life. She's the one. And I wanted to stay married. And by the way, we're celebrating this October 41 years. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. I, I always tease and say, she's such a blessed woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually the blessed one. So anyway, how did I realize or when did I realize that I had the problem? It was a progression. And of course, the, the process at that moment, that again, that was the turning point for me. And I said, look, I don't know how to do this. I've been fighting it for years, my teenage years, all of that. I'll get help wherever that is. Carrie, this was 40 years ago. Anger management classes wasn't even in the universe. You know, it didn't exist. Mm, Printed material wow. was rare, you know, books on anger management, things like that. So I went to my pastor and I said, look, I need to chat. And so I went to him and, and got an appointment with him. And I said, uh, hey, I, I need help. I got an anger issue. And his advice was, well, son, get in the altar and pray. And you'll be okay. Let me clarify. I don't want to ever take away the power of prayer. Prayer sure. changes things. Mm -hmm. But what I started my journey in learning is faith without works is dead. I mean, yes. we can pray all day long and fast until our tongues fall out. But if we don't put some action, some works to our faith, we're, we're not going to get very far. So I took his advice. I got in the altar and I really prayed and and a man felt better, got up, and a day or two later, I'm, I'm throwing things again. I'm yelling and screaming. I'm back into the same mode. So Gail and I really just started a journey of trial and error. When I'd get upset or get crazy, I'd cool down. And, of course, we amplified not going to bed angry with each other. And we really worked on letting each other walk away and breathe and intellectualize the situation, then come back and talk about it. And I allowed her to tell me what I did wrong. So again, this whole process was started right there. I'm 58. And that was when I was 18. I turned 18 September 10th and got married October 4th. I mean, like, I'm done. Let's, let's get this done. 
So that was probably hard in the beginning. You, you were saying I let her tell me kind of what I did wrong, really receiving that feedback of, yeah. hey, even if it was how she perceived the situation, and that could have been totally different than how you perceived the situation. Yes, yes. And it took a lot of discipline on my part to listen to her because she, even though she was inside the emotional circle, she was outside of my anger circle. She was able to see what I, how I was reacting to things, what I was reacting to, and was able to help me troubleshoot that and define, well, why did you get angry with, when I said mashed potatoes, that's an example that, but you know, mm -hmm. sometimes we get mad over the most ridiculous things, big, not because True. of mashed potatoes, but it's the emotional tie way back in the subconscious mind. Hmm. So there wasn't a whole lot of help out there for you. Like you really looked for books and materials. There weren't classes. Now you're actually involved in teaching some of those classes, correct? The anger yes. management? Yes, I've, I've professionally taught anger management and emotional intelligence probably about 17-ish years, 17 years, give or take. Yeah, and again, back then, 40 years ago, again, printed material was just virtually almost non-existent. I found very little classes, training, teaching on it, non-existent. So as soon as stuff started being printed, I, I kept an eye on the shelves. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a book freak anyway. So I, you know, my Barnes and Noble days was long and I'd go in there and, and look around. And, and when I found something, I bought it and I read it and I digested it. And I tried, you know, everything I could to apply to my life to help me. Hmm, good. That's good. Because anger can be destructive, and you already talked about that, like, you know, putting your hand through a door or breaking things, Christians sometimes try to suppress it or avoid it. Like we've labeled, instead of labeling that behavior as sinful, we've labeled the emotion of anger itself as sinful. And how can Christians develop a healthy biblical understanding of anger? Well, you really hit a, a great nerve there. That, you know, we as Christians, we've got a criteria to live up to. We're spirit filled and we're supposed to be having the fruits of the spirit and to represent Christ on the earth. And so we're not supposed to have any flaws and, or any any setbacks. So uh, I know I did. I suppressed it. I didn't want anybody to know I was an angry person, that I was this crazy raging dude that would put my fist through a window or a door or a wall or whatever. And that was really part of my problem. I never let anybody know I was in trouble. And so for years, I went through all of this and only to realize that in my journey to manage this, you do not get rid of anger. Anger is an emotion. It's a part of your, your psychic. It's just like love and, and uh, joy and happiness and all of that. It's identified as a negative emotion, although that could be turned around into a positive direction using your anger to force you to go positive. However, the understanding, and in fact, I'm big on the power of understanding. When we understand the who, the why, the what, how come, where they're coming from, where it's coming from, it helps us deal with a lot of things. It's okay to be angry. It's okay. Jesus was angry. Yes. He, when he come into the temple and found the money changers buying and selling, he got angry and drove out those money changers and said, my my house shall be called a house of prayer. So again, it's okay to be angry. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. And there's, right. there's the key right there. We can get upset. We can be angry with some situation, but here's where we need to be careful. Don't sin at it. Don't start violating somebody, cussing, using foul language or whatever that's going to bring a reproach on your walk with God. That's good. People to understand that if somebody disrespects you, it can upset you. Absolutely. People understand that whatever happens, it, it upsets us, it angers us, there's an injustice going on. For example, I, one of my friends on Twitter posted out that this kid, a uh, young man in, in Montana, him and his family, his mom and dad, are church planters, and they're trying to plant a new church in Montana. And this is a good kid, went to school, bullied, and the group that bullied him 
stabbed him 10 times and put him wow. in the hospital. And, Awful. you know, I, I, Carrie, I was angry. I, I wanted to fly to Montana and find the bullies, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but I, I, okay, God, I can't, I can't, you know, bring bodily harm, although I want to, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's okay. That's what we've really got to understand. It's okay to be angry. It's what you do with the anger that makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. I think that anger can be very powerful in terms of creating beautiful change in the world. Like, what if we never got angry about things like human trafficking or child abuse? I mean, we should be angry about those things that are going on in our society. And I know that there was some anger for me that fueled the start of this podcast because I got so tired of having people say, well, somebody told me anxiety is a sin or depression's a sin. That means I don't have enough joy in my life and I just need to pray through it. And, you know, it was just so frustrating that people were getting misinformation that wasn't biblical from spiritual leaders and it was causing extra distress on the distress that they already had that they were already bringing into therapy so yeah, yeah, yeah. this is this is good have you got a minute Let me, yeah can i tell a little quick little neat story about how anger compel us to to do a positive thing like yourself you sure. know, you're tired of spiritual leaders basically not bothering to study out and research anxiety mm -hmm. and really it's not a sin <laughs> anyway years ago I, I learned this story when i was doing some research of a beautiful family in suburban la nice suburban la I had a 13 year old daughter and daughter asked mom can i go to whoever their her friend just a few blocks over in a very nice suburban setting and of course, sure, not a problem. So only about two or three hours later, LAPD shows up on this lady's doorstep to tell her that her child, her 13-year-old, is dead, been wow. killed by a drunken driver mm. in in the neighborhood, in the, the suburban area. Of course, that went through it. They caught the guy, and the guy got a little bit of probation and 30 days in jail. It was wow, awful. Stupid. This guy killed this girl and got off way too easy. And so this woman in the story that I read had a choice. She was very angry that her daughter walked out the door and she never got a chance to say goodbye. You know, he, she's never coming back. She was in a very safe, nice neighborhood in suburban LA and her life was taken by a drunken driver cutting through the subdivision to go somewhere, swerved. She was on the sidewalk and the dude swerved up onto the sidewalk and hit her and killed her. Wow. She had a choice to make whether she's going to allow that anger to make her bitter, probably ruin her marriage and relationships to other children. However, she chose to allow the anger to drive her to a positive direction and make a difference. Her name is Candy, and she created Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and has literally changed the world in when it comes to DUIs. The, the laws have changed. The punishment's stiffer. They get what they deserve because one woman said, I'm not going to let this destroy me. I'm going to create something good out of my anger. Absolutely. Hopefully a little encouragement to your audience. Yes, that's that's good. Oftentimes we hear people say anger is a secondary emotion, meaning there's some other emotion underneath it. Tell us about the connection between anger and anxiety. Sure. And, and that is correct. Anger is always a secondary emotion. It's a byproduct. There's always a primary in place, such as loneliness, anxiety, another word, fear. The big kahunas is stress and frustration. When we don't manage those primaries, then they escalate to anger. Anger then, if it's not taken care of, escalates to rage. Rage goes to blind rage. I had a client years ago that I dealt with that went into blind rage and literally did $5,000 worth of damage to his mother's kitchen and denied it. Whoa. <laughs> he said, I didn't do that. There's no way I did that. He was in blind rage. He didn't even know what he was doing. So it can get ugly real fast. But again, let's, let's back up. We have anxiety. Now, of course, anxiety is a lot like, or it has one common thread with the other primaries. We all have stress in our life. Yes, and stress. We, That's you know, true. the stress of driving in traffic every day to work, stress in handling family situations. It's okay, and we all have frustration in our life. We all have a little bit of anxiety in our life, a little bit of worry, 
a little mm-hmm. bit of stress. You know, we've got something major coming up, whether it's a certification test or whether it is a presentation that we got to make it work, or we've got to deal something with our children. We all have what we would call normal stress, normal frustration, and even normal anxiety. The challenge comes is when it doesn't become normal anymore. We're stressed out more than we usually are. We're frustrated more than we usually are, or we're experiencing anxiety more than we usually do. So the fear is, the fears and the worries becomes extreme. It becomes excessive. Mm -hmm. And so that right there, the connection is, is when we don't deal with frustration or stress or anxiety, we start getting angry because we don't like the emotion. We don't like to feel stressed out. We don't like to feel frustrated. We don't like to feel the fear, the intense fear. You know, what's wrong with me? Why am I feeling so afraid? Why am I worrying so much about this thing? This ain't that big a deal. And everybody's saying, oh, just calm down. You'll be fine. You know, no, I'm not fine. So as you can see, anxiety really kind of ties into the frustration, that primary. And of course, if we don't get something to relieve it, then it's going to escalate to anger. We're going to start being mad at ourselves. We're going to be angry at other people trying to give us, and they mean well, they mean well, they're trying to help us, but they're not helping. Then we start getting angry at that and everything kind of blows up from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's like a domino reaction. You know, if you don't back up and deal with the the initial dominoes that cause the cascade to go, then you're not going to be able to resolve the issue. Whereas I think sometimes people in anger management situations will just say, okay, well, I've just got to catch myself before I get to that rage point, but they don't ever deal with those emotions that come before the anger point, which came before the rage point. Yes, ma'am. That is exactly right. It, again, it's a, it's a cascade. It, it's just, it starts falling and, you know, we've got to stop it somewhere. We've got to say, okay, wait a minute, stop right now. Yes. Absolutely. And probably the worst thing that you could do for an anxious or angry person is to tell them to calm down. That does not usually help at all. It usually causes more frustration or anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember years ago, the movie that came out with Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson, Anger Management? I don't th- I'm not sure if I saw that one. I don't oh, remember. Go, go back and dig it up. It's a great movie. And of course, it's a movie, Adam Sandler. I think he got thrown off a plane because he was angry. I'm not angry. (laughs) And Jack Nicholson is the therapist that's going to help him overcome his anger. They did everything wrong in getting the character that Adam Sandler is playing. A good friend of mine in L.A. was the consultant for anger management for for that movie. And uh, it was kind of knowing anger management. And Jack Nicholson was always saying, you need to just calm down, okay? Just <laughs> calm down. And and then, you know, the character that Adam, Adam Sandler is playing just goes through the roof, you know. It was hilarious. But you're right. When you say to an angry person or to an anxious person, just, just calm down, you're throwing fuel on the fire. Right. So tell us about your book, Control the Beast. Oh, boy. That was fun. As we've gone through this podcast, I've told bits and pieces of my story. Control the Beast is a book that we have just put out on the market that is really, for me, it's it's 40 plus years in the making because I was an angry, angry kid, young adult. And then Gail and I started when we got married on our journey of trial and error, trying to help me get rid of anger, which we realized I'm not going to get rid of it. I've got to learn how to manage it. Just like anxiety, you don't get rid of anxiety, you manage your anxiety. And that's what you do with anger is you learn how to manage your anger, how to identify and diffuse. So the book is based on 17 years of training this. I still do training of sharing this because my whole mission and purpose, I felt like God wanted me to give back. I was this person. I managed, I've gotten better and now I need to give back. So as we talked about earlier, when books and things started coming out, I started ingesting everything. When I did find some kind of training seminar workshop on anger, I took it. And then when certification classes actually came out, I did it. 
and became certified and then just started teaching. We taught with probation and parole, court services, several chambers of commerce have brought me in for lunch and learns. Companies brought me in for identifying and diffusing angry people, working with their management, et cetera, et cetera. So Control the Beast is, what is that? 12 chapters. And we start out with the power of understanding or discovering the beast. When we understand who we are, what's going on, what's our past, and everybody around us, again, the power of understanding helps us deal with it. Then chapter two is starve the beast. We've got to clean up our environment. There's triggers. And I in the book, I talked and I also taught it. There are six main triggers that exist. That, that's the six popular ones, starting out one with pornography, the addiction to pornography, television programming, what we're listening to, music, what we're reading, all could be triggers of anger. I imagine in your field, of dealing with anxiety, that could be, there could be some crossover there. So we talk about the importance of cleaning up our environment. Then it's not really a book about anger management as much as it is a guide, a manual, a how-to. I felt like people needed, okay, how do I do this? Because when I started, I'm like, what do I do? How do I handle this? And so I wanted to develop a guide, a manual to say, okay, read this and start following it and practicing it, and you can get your anger under control. So with that, we talk about how the beast works. And of course, the beast is our negative emotions. And that is emotional mechanics. The how does emotions fire? What triggers them? The biology of emotions. And then Mr. Beastie's game, that's the blame and responsibility. We always get in the blame game. Well, I wouldn't get angry if they would keep their stupid mouth shut, you know, things like that. And so you cannot go into the blame game and blame everybody and everything around you for your bad behavior. You got to own it. You got to take responsibility. Chapter five is the TMZ of the beast world. And that is the emotion, anger and emotion unveiled. We rip the lid off of it and we expose the beast for who it is, what it is. And then chapter six is kind of the pinnacle where we don't play games with the beast and that's diffusing negative emotions. That's the tools, the mechanisms that we can use to help like walk away, breathe, intellectualize the situation, get help, things like that. The beast layer is ambushes and disguises where it hides, such as a drug addiction and alcoholism attempts at suicide. People are angry at people around them, like teenagers will attempt suicide because they're very angry with their parents and they want to inflict pain upon them. And so we discover, we talk about the ambushes and the disguises that the beast does. Time to confront the beast. That's the answer to the question of self-identity. Who are we? Where are we? It takes a team to control the beast. And that, that is a chapter on vital relationships. I wrote a piece And I taught it and I put it in the book called Nine Levels of Relationships and How to Handle Toxic Relationships. So many times we get confused with the levels of relationships we have. For example, we have an acquaintance that we don't really know, but we want to make them a best friend. Well, can they be trusted with best friend status? Or we have a best friend that violates our trust. We can't keep them there. They have to move to a different category, you know, spousal relationship. Of course, the number one relationship that I talk about in nine levels is our relationship to God. That's got to be strong. That's got to be powerful. And then, of course, we, we work our way down to level nine, which is the toxic, the poisonous relationships that we've got to deal with. Because the only thing happens when you mess with a toxic relationship is that you get poisoned. You get hurt over and over and over. And you've got to get rid of that relationship. Not to say that it won't heal, not to say that you can't detox that relationship and put it back up into one of the other levels of relationships. It's a good chapter. I just did two or three podcasts on that chapter alone. Rebuild what the beast destroyed is rebuilding our self-esteem from our past, the shame that anger brings, negative emotions bring. And of course, then chapter 12, we talk about train the beast, and that's revitalizing the positive inner person. Okay. Wow. There's a lot in there, it sounds like. Yeah. Packed it with some meat, hopefully. (laughs) And sounds like very practical information, certainly takeaways that people can implement in their life and step-by-step instructions on how to do that. I like that. I like practical materials. I don't 
philosophical ones are nice, but if you don't know how to apply it, then sometimes it's completely worthless. If you can't put it into practice in your own life, then it's like, well, what's the point there? So yeah, that's yeah. right. And of course, we want to say to God be the glory for all of this. Mm -hmm. And we are getting a lot of great feedback awesome. when people read the book. They're hitting me on Instagram or Twitter. Hey, I just got your book, man. This is fantastic. And they use the word practical, which I'm like, yes, yes. We market. <laughs> you know, so that's good. Well, I think it's just beautiful that you have used your difficulties and struggles and challenges to allow God to use those things for good and then to bless other people and help them along their journey. So as we're kind of wrapping up our time together, I like to ask every guest to share a story of hope, which is a time in which you received hope from God or another person. Wow. Let me go here. And and we're going to talk about probably a lot of anxiety that I experienced in my life with everything else that's going on. Somebody being bullied like I was, or you've got somebody in your life that is, you know, they may not physically be bullying you, beating you up physically, but they're beating you up emotionally mm -hmm. and making you feel small, making you feel insufficient. It really messes with my emotions and kind of makes my eyes water a little bit when I think about the kid, Ed Snyder. And I knew me, I just love everybody. You know, I just wanted to get along with everybody and everybody's making fun of me and tormenting me and all of that stuff. And it literally, Carrie, destroyed my, my self-esteem. I couldn't see my way up. And if it wasn't for God putting somebody in my life that I called mother, where every day I come home from school after going through a day of, uh, it's supposed to be a day of learning, which was a day of abuse. She was there telling me, hey, you don't need those people. You can do anything you set your mind to do. God's got great things for you in your life. He's got stuff in you that you're going to do great with. You know, she was constantly just hitting me with that. And it really was a saving point in my life. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the time that God used my own mother to tell me, you don't listen to them. You're better than that. You're a good kid, et cetera, et cetera. And so as I grew, God just kept putting people in my life. One being my wife, we're, we're together. I mean, we're, we're peanut butter and jelly. I mean, we just, <laughs> you know, and of course she knows me she, and that's what I think everybody needs in their life is somebody that knows them inside and out. And, and she knows when to back off of me. She knows when to get in my face and wad up that iris face of hers and get, get straight. And I take it because I know she loves me. And so it's amazing how God puts people in your life that will help you. They're there to be a blessing to you, to build you up. And of course, Again, I don't want to take anything away from God, but God uses people. God uses work. Have your faith. God can do anything. He is everything. But sometimes he uses the hands and the voices of people to make that work. And of course, we're responsible for putting in the work. Faith without works is dead. You know, I went to the altar and I prayed after my pastor preached the message and I cried and I wanted God to heal me of this and get rid of it. I don't want to be like this anymore. And I get up and a day or two later, I'm back at it again. I had to figure out the work. What do I need to do myself to partner with God's power and prayer to make it happen? Maybe that's what I need to help. It's a listener of yours in your audience, whether you're dealing with anxiety or you're dealing with stress or frustration or even anger. God's putting people in your life, this podcast, perhaps get back to this podcast and get the help that you need so that you can put the work with your faith and God's going to do great things in your life. That's, that's great. That's great. So we're going to put links in the show notes to the book and to your website so that people Thank can you. reach you. Thank and you. this has been a great conversation and I think really valuable for our audience. So I appreciate you being here today. Well, if there's anything I can do for you or any of your listeners, please reach out to me. Our email's on the website hit me up on social media, whatever it is. But thank you again, Carrie, for the opportunity and the privilege of being on your podcast. I've enjoyed being with you today. You can find us online anytime at hopeforanxietyandocd.com. I would love to hear from you. You can head on over to the contact page and let me know what you think about these episodes. 
Thank you so much for listening. Hope for Anxiety and OCD is a production of By the Well Counseling in Smyrna, Tennessee. Our original music is by Brandon Mangram. Until next time, may you be comforted by God's great love for you.